Fighters are the simplest class in most editions of the game. Their modus operandi is to hit an enemy until it is dead, and they can usually take some hits in the process. Fighters can use most weapons and can wear all types of armour, and in original D&D they were the only class that could wield magic swords. Much discussion through the years has focused on the balance between wizards and fighters. Wizards become so much more powerful than fighters in later levels, leaving fighters to have less impact in the later stages of the campaign. My view is that there is no problem with this. Wizards are destined to be more powerful, but they are so fragile at the beginning of the game. In addition, a wizard becomes almost useless once all of his spells are expended, whereas the fighter can always fight. Still, there are some ways to make the fighter more important at later levels, I'll discuss this later in the video. Before then, let's take a look at how the fighter appears in the various versions of D&D. A very brief history lesson that many of you may already know, the D&D rules were based on the Chainmail game, and the D20 combat system was originally a variant system. Chainmail and OD&D had three combat systems, mass combat, man-to-man, -man, and fantasy combat. The mass combat system was used to represent combat between groups of 20 men, so it was used specifically for large-scale battles. The man-to-man -man combat system was used for individuals in combat. It used 2d6 with a target number depending on the weapon used and the opponent's armour, henceforth called armour class. Rolling equal or higher would kill the opponent. The fantasy combat table was similar, representing monstrous foes. Again, rolling above the required number on 2d6 would result in a kill, but rolling equal would result in pushing the defender back one move. Humans on this table are called heroes, superheroes and wizards. Heroes represent four normal fighters, superheroes represent eight normal fighters, and wizards represent two armoured men. The man-to-man -man and fantasy combat systems were supposed to be used in original D&D, but as it required tables that were only printed in chainmail, not all D&D players owned the chainmail rules, so many people used the alternative D20 system, which was the origin of the system that has been used in every edition since. If we take a look at the stats for the fighter and apply it to the man-to-man -man combat table, we see the fighting capability represents the number of attacks. The pluses are applied to only the first attack, as seen in Book 2 of OD&D. In this example, a first level fighter gets one attack with a plus one bonus. At second level, two attacks, the first having a plus one bonus, and at third, three attacks with no bonus. The hero minus one entry is reserved only for the fantasy combat table, fighting monsters, where the swordsman would roll 2d6 minus one. However, using 2d6 obviously yields different results when applying a plus one bonus. A plus one on a d20 is always equal to 5%, but on 2d6 the bonus is between 3% and 17% depending on the required number, as I've tried to represent in this table. Using this system, fighters get multiple attacks against one hit dice creatures, and their chance to hit is dependent on the weapons they are using and the armour worn by the opponent. Using these rules, we can imagine a third level fighter with a sword fighting against three goblins. He would get three attacks, each of which would require a 9 or more on 2d6, equivalent to ascending armour class of 15. If the fighter was using a flail, he would require a 7 or more on 2d6, the equivalent of ascending armour class 9. The type of weapon used makes a big difference. But still, the fighter has the chance of killing all three goblins in a single round. The goblins, on the other hand, have a minus one penalty to attack in daylight, which is more significant in a 2d6 system than the d20 system. Compare this to the d20 alternative, the third level fighter only needs to get a 13 to hit, but only gets a single attack. When the Greyhawk supplement was released, some modifications were made to the attack rolls and damage bonuses exclusively to high strength fighters. If the man vs man 2d6 system was being used, these bonuses were quite significant, but most likely the d20 was considered the default system by this time. 
It was with this supplement that the hit dice of the fighter increased from d6 to d8, but all monsters increased d8 hit dice as well. Multiple attacks are not explicitly described in the rules, but are confirmed in issue 2 of the Strategic Review. Fighting men get a number of attacks against one hit dice monsters equal to their level. Multiple attacks don't make a similar appearance in the basic and expert sets, but they did reappear in advanced D&D. There, the fighter gains a number of attacks equal to his level against enemies of less than one hit dice, quite a downgrade, but also gets additional attacks at his full attack bonus at 7th and 13th level. Taking a look at how combat worked in Chainmail does at least provide an explanation for the one hit dice multiple attack rule, which seems quite puzzling otherwise. Finally, let's take a look at the rules cyclopedia. Here, various combat options are available to the fighter, including lance attacks, setting a spear against charging opponents, multiple attacks, smash, parry and disarm. Most of these were only available to name level fighters. Parry, for example, requires 9th level, which is odd. To me, these combat abilities should be available much earlier, even at first level, and perhaps to other classes than fighter as well. The multiple attack ability requires level 12, and multiple attacks may only be made against opponents that require a 2 to hit, which is basically nobody until a few levels later. By the time multiple attacks are appearing in a Cyclopedia game, it is unlikely that such foes will be bothering the party. Rules Cyclopedia also has rules for weapon proficiencies as well. However, it is worth noting that this system has characters go from level 1 to level 36, so the scaling and availability of the extra rules are less likely to be seen, if we presume that most campaigns end around the level 10 mark. I'm not too familiar with this second edition AD&D and the various source books, so I will leave it there. The difference between the fighter class in the various systems is not a big one. One could argue that fighters are less effective in basic expert D&D, as they have fewer attacks and their combat manoeuvres are available later. There has always been a power struggle between the fighter and magic user in D&D, and an effort to balance them. Once the wizard gets the fireball spell, they are able to take out large numbers of low-level creatures with ease. Even at first level with a sleep spell, the wizard can be highly effective. A wizard with a fireball wand far exceeds the killing capabilities of a fighter, so the multiple attacks are required as a way of balancing this. Whatever efforts are made to balance the two classes, I think it is inescapable that the wizard will simply be more powerful than the fighter at higher levels. However, when considering the balance of classes in an RPG, one must consider differences outside of ability score and numerical power. There are ways to balance classes within the campaign setting in a narrative fashion. In settings such as the Forgotten Realms, wizards appear to be fairly common and magic is a part of everyday life. In a sword and sorcery style campaign setting, wizards are not trusted and are usually evil. It is a significant downside to your character class if discovery of your abilities will result in hostility from the public. Depending on the degree of hatred that the people have against magic users, a wizard revealed in town could face banishment or even death in such a setting. On the other hand, pseudo-medieval societies would probably prize strong warriors. Fighters have a chance to win land and honour through battle and conquest, and the mightiest warriors would be re most respected in society. The nobility would be trained in combat, so one can assume that most of those in power would be fighters. It can be assumed that fighters have other skills as well, depending on the system used. As well as physical skills, there is no reason that fighters cannot have social skills, craft skills and mercantile skills. It is unfortunate that since 3rd edition, almost all skills available to fighters have been physical ones. Having said that, the primary purpose of the fighter in BX and other OSR systems is the same. Stand in the front line, protect the weaker members of the party, and kill the enemy. Fighters should have good armour and strong weapons. What a fighter can do outside of combat is mostly available to the other classes as well. But playing a fighter doesn't have to be boring. 
there are plenty of ways that you can make your character interesting. A fighter has proficiency in all weapons, so you could focus on ranged combat, having a light armoured and swift footed archer. However, the effectiveness depends on the composition of the rest of the party. A frontline fighter would still be required. I think that differentiation between fighters and adding interest to the class will be achieved through role-playing and the non-combat skills that the fighter has. Since non-combat skills are not included in most OSR systems, this may be difficult to achieve. What do you think about the fighter class in old school D&D? Is it underpowered and is it a boring class? I'm really interested to know the general opinion of the fighter class and if it was a good idea for newer versions of the game to add more abilities to the fighter's repertoire. If you'd like to support the channel, leave a comment, subscribe and you can even pick up one of my books at Drive Through RPG. Keep your eyes peeled as well for an upcoming Patreon announcement. As always, thanks for watching.